coming. And welcome you to our presentation on behalf of the Coggle Falls Historical Society. Just two quick reminders. We have some candles in the back that we collaborated with Hope So on Front Street um, to remind you of Lawson's. And so the candle you'll notice on the front, there's a picture of the Lawson's plant, which we all remember that smell, those of us from Coffee Falls, very much missed. So um, those are available. Also, if you are not a member of the Historical Society and you're here for this wonderful presentation, you're obviously interested in history, so we encourage you uh, to become a member. It's dollars a year um, for an individual and 20 for a family so it's very reasonable it supports our museum and we really encourage you to join because it supports the history of the city which a lot of you have a great deal of affection for the other thing I'd like to remind you next Wednesday night our museum over on Cook Street will be open for an open house if you'd like to drop by and take a tour through and see what we got going on over there. We're always doing something. And there's always something interesting walking through the door. Not that the people are interesting, but they can stay great. <laughs> and so we encourage you to come over and, and visit with us. So we're always open on Mondays and Saturdays from 10 to noon in a special open house next Wednesday from 5 to 7 if you'd like see what we got. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Vic, who we're very fortunate to have with us tonight. And I'd also like to say, if you'll notice as you go out, there is a donation box. So if you're not ready to join, you know, we wouldn't mind if you dropped a dollar or two in there to support the Historical Society. It would be very much Society. When we were doing our uh, documentary World War One, I have copies, by the way, and it is online. Uh, we did a lot of work with Marge and Jerry and the folks, and uh, a lot of great resources there. So historical societies, museums, archives, uh, always in need of support. Never enough time, money, uh, space, or staff. So <laughs> always a labor of love, it seems, as this project was, as I'll, I'll tell you about. So uh, tonight, yeah, I'm talking about my, my first book. The second book is about the... Uh, 
World War One documentary we did uh, acting some time in World War One. We're trying to get the letters published uh, that appeared in the film and a lot of the ones that uh, uh, didn't make the film cut. We had 45 minutes and we had about two hours worth of material. So uh, the University of Active Press, which published the Goodyear book, is also looking at publishing that. And I got my review back from my first uh, reviewer. I need to make some changes. Always, always. Things. But uh, anyway, uh, labor of love uh, here. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, background, about who we are, uh, what we do at the archives, uh, background about the Goodyear photo collection, and kind of how I got involved in all this. Um, so again, I'm head of archives and special collections at the University of Akron, uh, formerly archival services. Uh, we're the division of university libraries that collects, preserves, and provides access to archival material, mostly primary source material and some secondary source material that documents the history of the University of Akron and the region. Uh, why do we collect all these materials? We're probably one of the largest archives in the state. If you go into an archives, take a storm site, you see a, a box that's one cubic foot, we have about 40,000 cubic feet. So, uh, yeah, I've been here 15 years and we've uh, just touched the surface. <laughs> uh, amazing collections built by my predecessor, John Miller, so if you think some of the crowd is to you, John. And uh, since I've been there, uh, we're kind of moving more into a preservation and access phase and doing more with digitization and online uh, access and forward publishing. Uh, so why don't we collect these? We collect these to support the research and scholarly activity of the university and the wider intellectual community. So we support our students, our faculty, our staff. We are open to the general public. Uh, we get scholars who are from all over the world, uh, particularly researching our rubber industry and light of an air uh, collections, which uh, we'll see some of those today and some of them are in the book. Um, I kind of touched upon our, our collections really document the history of the University of Akron, Akron and Summit County, Ohio Canals, um, the rubber and polymer industry, obviously, and the related industry of light and air flight. Um, so when I came on board in 2007, uh, my boss, the dean at that time, um, was working with our development department to work with Goodyear to acquire their extensive photo morgue or photo archives. We had already acquired from Goodyear their extensive um, historical archives or records of, of the company going back to their founding in 1898. I believe those records were donated in the 90s, uh, but they had this amazing photo morgue uh, that they held on to that uh, we're interested in acquiring at the University of Akron Archives so we can preserve it, make it more readily available to the public. And I'll start off by saying I'm not an expert on Goodyear's history, but I've learned a lot in 15 years. It is probably our, our flagship, our premier collection. Gentleman up here, he's gonna kill me for saying it, but Keith, he's, uh, I'd say, the unofficial historian for Goodyear. He's uh, incredible knowledge. So anything I get wrong today, he will, <laughs> he'll correct. But he reviewed the book. I had other people that are experts in the fields of the various aspects that you'll see in the book that uh, checked uh, some of the facts. It saved me some, some embarrassing errors. So thanks to Keith and everybody else, Light on Air Society folks. That, looked over the book and uh, meticulously researched. Uh, the Goodyear Collection is one of our largest there at the University of Akron Archives. So fortunately for me, as an author, an archivist, and a researcher, I had all the material right there at my feet. So it, it made it made it easy. It didn't mean that I had spent a lot, a lot of hours away from home uh, in the archives, you know, digging through uh, Goodyear's records. And uh, again, you know, as much time as I spent doing the tip of the iceberg. So the photo collection itself from Goodyear was acquired in 2008. As I mentioned, it's part of the larger collection of their corporate records. It's considered, when we had the appraisal done years ago, an official uh, appraisal, the monetary value of the collection, uh, they considered it one of the oldest and largest corporate uh, photo archives in the nation. F.A. Cyberlane, one of the co-founders of the company, and one of his sons, if you ever go over to Stan Hewitt, they have an exhibit about uh, one of the Cyberlane sons that was very interested in photography. And uh, so we, we believe, kind of believe or surmise that's why they were photographing the history of the company uh, very early. We, we have images going back to, to 1898 with the founding of the company. Founded about 1.2 million archivists. We don't care about the monetary value, it was the scholarly or historical value of these resources, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Uh, we don't have, as you'll see in the book, if you get a copy, an exact count of how many photos uh, we have in the collection, but if anyone wants to come down and count them all, we'll, we'll let you. <laughs> um, 
We estimate 93,000 folders of images, mostly negatives, acetate, nitrate negatives, um, polyester negatives, color negatives, some prints. So somewhere between 500,000 photos and a million photos. I've looked at everyone. No, I <laughs> I have looked at everyone that uh, we, we digitized, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So it visually documents the history of Goodyear again from 1898 to about 1984. And the company held on to some of their more recent photos of what we had in the archives uh, documents that come up through 84. We have some photographic prints in the regular collection that come up probably through the late 90s, early 2000s. Collection documents, subjects important in American and world history, things like factory conditions, the labor industry, obviously, the rubber industry, uh, women in the workforce, uh, lighter and heavier than air flight. Amateur professional sports, believe it or not, because you had their own sports teams, and some of those went on to uh, some of those folks to win gold medals and participate in the Olympics. Um, aeronautics, advertising, work of time production. It, it's an amazing resource on uh, local, um, national, and world history. You know, Goodyear was a global company from very early on, and uh, some of the photos do document the rubber plantations and factories uh, overseas. Um, as the former Goodyear photographer, um, Aaron Vander Summers simply said, Goodyear's history is in those files. And I quote that in the book. I, I love that. So simply put, it's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it said the country's history is in those files. So Goodyear's history goes further than, than uh, just the company or the area here. And every time when I started 15 years ago, and he'd introduce me and he'd say, This is Vic, he's going to have all of our photos digitized and online. <laughs> 15 years, we have about 23,000 of them online, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, I like these photos. This is one of the, the students we had working on the collection years ago, but these, this is kind of the condition we received it in. There are all these surplus army uh, green cabinets, and um, that kind of gives you an idea of the size of the collection. Uh, it's, it's rather extensive, so um, I don't know if you normally let them know, but there are 266 files of work. I didn't know that. See? <laughs> How he retains all this information. Two hundred sixty-six. that's because they are numbered, I think. Yeah. Correct, but that's after the five rows that are empty from the twenty three. Yes. Years. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, there you go. More books. <laughs> he throws. He comes down. He's probably he might have spent more time in these photos than I have. Um, but anyway, that gives you an idea of the, of the size and, and kind of the, the scope. Um, in order to try to digitize some of these materials and make them more readily available, we applied for a National Endowment for Humanities grant in 2010. She's hard to believe it's been over 10 years since this project started and ended. Um, and we were able to digitize with that 33,000, uh, about 23,400 photos from the company archives. We picked all of the early images from 1898 through 1951. We picked 51 as the cutoff date because if you know anything about Nitrate film. Nitrate film was produced all the way up through 1951. Uh, sometimes it could be used after 51, but it was never produced after 51. It's mostly for motion picture film, although we did identify hundreds, if not thousands, of um, images, still images from the photo collection on uh, nitrate film base. So, if you know anything about those, if you have any in your historical society, caution, those can't, it's more the, the motion picture film. It generates its own heat as it decomposes, um, and therefore it can spontaneously combust. It cannot be extinguished by water or under sand. You can look at YouTube videos where they're lighting these things on fire, somewhere safe <laughs> and controlled conditions, uh, and trying to extinguish them when they can. So, so that was a concern. So a newly on campus mountain of archival material to take care of. By the way, you have these nitrates, you have to do something. Okay, uh, they're identified, they're now in cold storage um, on campus, or nitrate motion picture film from Goodyear and other collections are off campus in a storage, nitrate storage vault. There's only about three in the country that I found that were in storage of some kind of form, but uh, the still images are on campus in a fireproof nitrate uh, storage container. <clears throat> um, so it was about a two, two year project to digitize all these photos. I'll probably get too much into the background, I'm going to jump into the photos. But 
So <clears throat> we applied for phase two of this NEH grant. All the reviewers said, this is great, give them the money. But we didn't get the money. <laughs> I think they wanted to spread the wealth a little bit. And uh, so I had this idea, well, you know, as a faculty member at the university, I'm supposed to be publishing. And maybe this will be, I've always wanted to do a book. Maybe this will be my first book. So the idea was to promote the photograph, use the book to promote the photographs and the use of the collection. Uh, to share the photos with larger audience, put them in the historical context, tell some of the stories behind the photos, and include your rich and fascinating history. And then my other motive uh, was to try to persuade the National Art of Humanities to fund phase two, which would be hopefully digitizing 60,000 color uh, negatives in the collection. So we found out color deteriorates faster than some of the earlier uh, polyester and even acetate or nitrate based films. Early color film in gray is very rapid. Anyway, so I had the bright idea to do this book. My wife and daughter are still talking to me. <laughs> I was my daughter was six when I started this. She was twelve when I finished it. So it took me six years. And she would say, "Daddy, what's taking so long? Does this book go back to the time of the dinosaurs?" I said, "No, it only covers fifty-three years, a fifty-three-year year period of the company's history. But it's a fascinating history, um, and we'll get into some of that." In uh, three themes emerged as I was, I did review all 23,300 images, um, and those are people, places, and products. The book is originally going to be a larger volume that had these three sections, and the University Press said, no, it's possible to pick one. <laughs> uh, so I picked products. So the first book really focused on good your products, and there's just a, a million of them. It's just amazing what the company was involved in from the beginning to really up to today. But, uh, 51. That seems like an odd time period that the book covers. Again, it's because of, that's what we digitized because of the nitrate film. And we only had $300,000. Um, so this book focuses on the products of Goodyear, which I think are the most interesting and fascinating. Um, you'll see in the book a lot of images that have never been, been seen or published before. Uh, a lot of historically significant and artistic or aesthetically pleasing images. Those are the ones I I tried to pick, I reviewed a lot of other books, and I tried to pick images that had not been published before. Um, I organized them into chapters, we'll talk about those in a minute. Tires, airships, balloons, mechanical goods or industrial products, and then more products. And each chapter is broken down into uh, subdivisions for those different types of products, and we'll see those here in a minute. So somebody had asked me, the gentleman in the back there, how many pages I can remember. There it is, 268 pages. It would have been three times that size if it would let me. Uh, maybe there'll be a volume two and three, but uh, I gotta ask my wife first. Um, nearly 200 photographs are in the book. Uh, again, many never seen them before. Some of them were considered top secret at one point in time. Some of the folders we even got from Goodyear still said top secret on them. Some of them were stamped uh, top secret during the war. I'll talk about some of those war products and why those were top secret at the time. Um, so as I mentioned, I extensively researched these. We had uh, experts um, graciously um, spent their time to proofread the book. Uh, it's handled heavily annotated with 300 endnotes, uh, visually chronicles Goodyear's fascinating history. So some of the earliest products, actually the earliest products Goodyear produced um, were carriage car and cycle tires. The first products to roll off the Goodyear production line, the date I have November 21st, 1898 were carriage tires and bicycle tires. So at this time, turn of the 20th century, automobile wasn't quite in its own yet. We had the horseless carriage, we had uh, electric cars coming on a little bit later, but people were mostly still <coughs> um, getting about with a horse-drawn wagon or transferring, uh, according to goods and horse-drawn wagons. So could you really focus in those early years on, <coughs> excuse me, um, tires, uh, rubber tires for um, for carriages. Uh, this one shows uh, a Style D um, a machine used to put the tire on the rim. Goodyear not only invented a lot of different processes, but also equipment in order to be able to properly manufacture things. Or in this case, since Kelly Springfield controlled the only practical device for the purpose of attaching the tire to the rim, um, Bill State, Goodyear's master and develop this machine to break the Kelly monopoly. Some of the photos show the raw materials and production scenes, like this one here, 
in the carriage uh, tire room in 1914. Let's see, by the time of this photograph, Goodyear had captured 75% of the carriage tire market and then sold nearly 4 million carriage tires for roughly 1 million customers. Um, we'll have to find out from my research. Again, uh, the other early uh, product to roll off the line was bicycle tires. So again, cars weren't as prevalent, just coming into their own, so a lot of people were getting around uh, via bicycle. So um, Goodyear did you know, F.A. Cyberling and uh, PW Litchfield came along. They were just experts at, at marketing, uh, coming up with marketing ideas, and they were promoting their products. So, uh, 1916 to promote bicycles, they came up with these national bicycle races uh, that they sponsored. And uh, this one million bicycles for 1916 campaign, in which they told bicycle uh, dealers they would try to help sell one million bicycles, which then they would shot hopefully with two million. With your bicycle tires. Uh, so this one's out in Oakland, California. There's a whole series of these. I'm always interested in what this gentleman is on this bike here, this high bike. And, uh, some type of contraption came up with in front of the Goodyear store there. Uh, by the time of this photograph, Goodyear made supposedly 15,000 bicycle tires per day. I always wonder if these numbers are a little inflated, but you know, uh, that's what we have in the archives and the records and in the annual reports. Um, obviously, very early on, Goodyear wanted to get into the manufacture of automobile tires. Um, 1900, they hired Paul Litchfield, who had experience with automobile, automobile tire manufacturing in New England. Uh, they began solving some of the problems of the early uh, automobile tires at that time, uh, developing the straight side tire and Ford tires. So, a lot of photographs in the collection will show thousands, hundreds, thousands, probably, obviously, photographs studio shots to um, failed tires, those never happen. <laughs> uh, competitors' tires, and then some that I think are the most historically interesting and fascinating are some that shot uh, some interesting vehicles uh, of the day. So this was the um, considered America's first fully armored military vehicle known as the Davidson Cadillac Armored Car, developed by Earl Page Davidson and his cadets at the Northwestern Military Academy in Chicago. Uh, it sported the Goodyear uh, patented uh, all-weather diamond treads, which is a, a very popular uh, tread design, tire yeah, tread design that um, the company had for many, many decades. <laughs> uh, one of my favorites, uh, I'm a big cola fan, I love soda pop, <laughs> I'm never gonna grow up. Uh, the Moxie horse would do. Uh, Moxie was a little before my time, I did find Moxie down in uh, Amish uh, country. There's an antique store down there. The guy that actually is on Pawn Stars sometimes, if you watch that, he runs a little shop down there and he sells Moxie and Cola in his uh, shop. It's okay. <laughs> Something different. But uh, so good your tires. I think these are pneumatics. Shot, shot this uh, Moxie Horsemobile 1931. The company used it to obviously promote their, their, uh, their soda, their product. Tires during that time period and showed up in parades and everything. <clears throat> there's a steering wheel that come, coming out of the horse's mane there. And it looks like there's, I wonder how he braked and accelerated. It looks like they uh, extended the, the brake there. And the stirrups are hooked to the control. Are they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, the Goodyear building is it incredible? I think so, yeah. yeah. It looks like yeah. it. You know, it's on Market Street. Yeah. Um, racing was involved, <clears throat> uh, Goodyear was involved in racing really almost from the start of the company. Uh, they tested their, their tires in uh, various um, racing, including automobile racing. Uh, first automobile race from my research to feature Goodyear tires was uh, 1901. Supposedly by 1909, every major race in the country was won on Goodyear tires. Uh, this image shows the 1922 Indianapolis 500. Uh, that's the winner crossing the finish line, obviously on Goodyear tires. Uh, after the race, Goodyear withdrew from racing, auto racing, and took a 37-year hiatus uh, from the sport to cut costs. I don't think they got back in the first till the late 50s. They, they came back via uh, NASCAR in the late 50s and there was a full line of, of tires at that time. We, we can go through that kind of stuff after you've done the presentation. 
Oh, okay, I'm yeah, sure, sure. There yeah. might be some racing things. Well, no, I, I don't want to interrupt your. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, Goodyear also made, uh, obviously, uh, tires for various types of, of automobiles and, and uh, tires during the war, including war tires. Some were made from recycled rubber or synthetic rubber. Uh, they got into motorcycle tires very early on. Uh, they had the manufacturing company that made the Indian motorcycles in 1901. Harley Davidson started producing their motorcycle in 1903. Uh, so Goodyear wanted to get in on this and start manufacturing Goodyear motorcycle tires in 1909. Uh, 1910, they sold their first motorcycle tires. They even developed uh, kind of like the carriage tires, their own machinery or equipment for uh, producing these types of tires. Uh, it's called the perfect tire, like their competitors, uh, they build theirs by hand, and therefore there can be human error in the tires. So uh, by the time of this photograph, 1914, Goodyear supposedly produced uh, 1,000 motorcycle tires per day. Like automobile racing, they tested them in the various motorcycle races of the day. If anybody ever watched um, Harley and the uh, Davidson's kind of docudrama, docu-series that was on years ago, it was, uh, I thought it was a great series. It really depicted uh, what motorcycle racing was like at that time. Very dangerous sport was run on uh, horse tracks or velodromes at the time. Later they developed these uh, murder drones, which the press later dubbed as murder drones, uh, because these tracks were so dangerous, there were so many wrecks, the racers were uh, you know, getting gruesome injuries, wrecking in the crowds, and uh, some were even killed. So um, I think it was Harley that got out of uh, motorcycle racing at that time. Uh, and Goodyear showed you there. By 1913, Goodyear could claim that all professional and amateur world records for motorcycles had been set by bikes equipped with their tires. One story that I'm saying for uh, the second book is, I think his name was Jake DeRoser, he was one of the uh, prominent motorcycle racers at the time. He came to Akron to go to Goodrich to use their tires, uh, as the story goes. He ended up at Goodyear by mistake. Goodyear, Goodrich, what's the difference? <laughs> I think they knew who he was or figured out who the guy was and says, we got a money maker here, hire this guy, put him on good your tires. And supposedly he won a bunch of races on these tires. But after that kind of fell out of favor due to the, uh, the danger of the sport, people got into the cross country motorcycle racing. People heard Cannonball Baker, the Cannonball Run. I love those movies. That was came out when I was a kid. <laughs> but uh, this really started in the teens and 20s motorcycle riders trying to race across the, the country coast to coast. Of course, Goodyear get on, got in on it and, and uh, did some promotions uh, for these. This is uh, Goodyear motorcycle going from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, and I think that's outside the, the Goodyear uh, corporate headquarters. Um, motorcycle tires shot military uh, motorcycles in World War I. The uh, war on the Mexican border with Pancho Villa, and of course, in World War II. Um, you got tires, you got to have tubes. They made tubes, including bullying, bullet sealing uh, tubes. Uh, they claimed that uh, tubes and rims uh, were manufactured for every kind of vehicle that rolls or flies. I love this image of the ring manufacturing. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, Goodyear manufacturing and sold a complete line of rims for cars, trucks, buses, and construction vehicles in their rim plant. Akron was considered one of the largest in the nation uh, by World War II. Goodyear also got involved into again anything that rolls or flies, so trucking. Goodyear was involved in, in trucking tires from the very start. Um, they had solids, cushion, and pneumatics. They were really pushing um, transportation, trucking to adopt pneumatic tires. We're very involved with that. This shows uh, government trucks and transit. A campaign known as Packard's for Pershing, Packard's truck for General Pershing's army during World War I. Um, they had the Akron to Boston Express, where they would take tires and products back and forth, and then later their Transcontinental Motor Express. Again, apparently photographers went along and, and they photographed these journeys to show how these tires could travel um, really rough roads or no roads, really, at that time. 
Uh, one of my favorites, I think this was on the Facebook post, is this uh, ad truck from 1932 showing the, the famous diamond tread. Uh, there were we have another image of a similar truck, too. So I think there were two of these that the company manufactured to promote their tires. Uh, for my research, this truck was used as a mail truck and to service their outdoor advertising signs. Buses, if you want to get into busing, uh, so they tested their tires on their own bus line and took employees from Goodyear Heights, their company housing, to the factory. Um, later, they shot buses by Greyhound bus lines that supposedly crossed the deserts of North Africa in the Middle East. So again, really a global company there promoting their, their tires all over the world by, uh, by this time. Uh, we even have a series of images of rail cars and um, trains that, that feature tires. This is a Fairbanks Morse rail car, uh, kind of an interesting innovation, never really caught on, but uh, so the tires are made either run on rails or on the road. So it shows a jack here. There's a, as you can see in the car, there's a series of photos. If you want to turn around and go the other direction or get up on the road, you jack up the car, two guys can swing it around and you're off. <laughs> so the train's not going. <laughs> so uh, I think these were all kind of experimental vehicles. But, uh, anyway, airplane tires, Scooter got involved with airplane tires in early start. They, they knew and worked with the Wright brothers. We have some signed letters in the collection from the Wright brothers. Uh, Glenn Martin, Glenn H. Curtis. Uh, bef before airplanes were shot with tires, if you've been to the Dayton and seen the Wright Flyers in the early airplane, they had uh, they had used bicycle tires, or the Wright Brothers planes used the skids, so they wanted to get tires on, on planes and were very involved with that uh, from a very early date. So I like this photo, the, the Memphis Bell. So obviously during World War II, Goodyear's only manufacturing tires for airplanes and fighter planes and bombers, but also hoses and pads and all different things for airplanes, including airplanes themselves on the internet. But uh, there's a promotional shot of the Memphis Bell that visited NACA in 1943, and uh, one of the good aircraft employees hosing the tire. Um, tractor tires, I like this one just because it's out of the acronym. I believe that's the acronym for it. So this was the air wheel, which is considered the donut. So um, earlier tires were either solid or just steel rims, and they tend to bog down in the dirt, especially the sandy soils in Florida. So they did a lot of their testing in the mountain Arizona. So they came up with this idea that uh, would not sink in those those types of loose soils, but then also could be used on places like golf courses and runways. So they would they would pull the airplanes to the uh, to the runway. Uh, tons of tires for off the road vehicles, large construction and earth moving vehicles. Uh, I love this one just because of the, the tire mold. It was considered a, a 20 ton mold. This was their 300,000 tire. Those shot things like the, the Marsh Bummy, which was used by the Gulf Oil Company to uh, traverse the marshes in the, the Florida Everglades and uh, in uh, Louisiana, trying to find better places to drill for oil. And of course, I believe this was in the Facebook post. If you saw it, the, the Snow Cruiser was sort of my favorite. Uh, Ten foot high tires, 750 pounds a piece. I think they manufactured five. There was a spare. <laughs> so, obviously, airships. They're involved in airships from a very early time. F.A. Cyberling uh, was interested in, in aviation, figure lighting their flight. So in the early 1910s, um, they started manufacturing a gas bag for. Explorer Melvin Vanneman's airship, which uh, they named the Akron. Cyberling wanted to see the name Akron carried across the, the Atlantic. So this was going to be the first transatlantic flight by blimp. And of course, that ended in tragedy. Uh, exploded off the coast of New Jersey shortly thereafter in 1912, killing uh, Vanneman and his crew. After that, F.A. said, I don't really have the heart to, to be an airship manufacturing anymore. And it wasn't until uh, about 1916-17 during World War I uh, when the uh, government came calling and said we really need uh, a company to manufacture airships for World War I. Uh, so they manufactured these and tested them and trained pilots out at Wingfoot Lake, which is considered uh, the, wing, uh, the Kitty Hawk of Larry Bennett flight. 
uh, the Pony Blip, this is kind of a, an interesting blip. So they, uh, this was out in LA, I think that's where the, the original one or ones were, uh, uh, were stored and, and uh, serviced. Uh, but they promoted these as every man's airship for commercial, sporting, and military purposes. <coughs> uh, the idea never caught on. I, mean, I don't know what they cost. Uh, I can't imagine. <coughs> Out of your own blimp back in the day, <laughs> if you had the money and the means. Uh, so there's just hundreds of images in the collection, and uh, uh, carefully selected many in the book that show various blimps from the Goodyear fleet flying over import. And there's uh, landmarks like the U.S. Capitol, the Cleveland Lake Shore, I think is the one featured on the cover. Um, this is one over Boston Harbor. Blimp B without the night sign. This is one of the early night signs called the Neonogram. Uh, the first blimp night sign appeared in 1933 over the Century of Progress Exposition in Chicago. Uh, the Ranger blimp, as I, as I found out, there were <clears throat> they named these blimps after the America's Cup uh, winners. So there wasn't just one Ranger blimp, I think there were like five Ranger blimps. There wasn't just one Mayflower, there were like six or seven or eight Mayflowers. So, uh, uh, some of these they manufactured for the war, for World War II, to do uh, patrols on the coast looking for U-boats. Um, other ones were, you know, commercial airships that were um, commandeered, for lack of a better word, requisitioned by the Navy and used during the war for patrol. Uh, the Ranger II was known as the Ghost Blimp. I always think this is an interesting story. Somebody from the History Channel or Discovery should do something on one of these and unsolved mysteries. Uh, the Ranger II was uh, patrolling the coast off of California in 1942 and mysteriously floated over the California coast, crashed in Daly City without its crew, who mysteriously, uh, mysteriously vanished. Uh, the dis disappearance of the crew is still an unsolved mystery. There's a bunch of uh, ideas of what happened. They fell out, they got in a fight. The pilot was cheating with the co pilot's wife, all these, all these things came up. They were abducted by aliens, I don't know. Anybody ever watch Josh Gates? He does some of those things too, he's on the history of discovery. He was in Akron last year speaking, my daughter and I went to see him. And I, I tried to catch him, he's got this really cool story you gotta do on your show. We got lots of great images on it, but uh, didn't get the copy. Um, so in addition to, to blimps or non-rigid airships, Goodyear was involved in pretty much every um, rigid airship in this country, starting with the USS Shenandoah. Uh, Goodyear manufactured the 20 gas cells at its Akron plant. Um, this airship achieved many firsts, but unfortunately crashed in Noble County, Ohio in 1925, killing 14 of its 43 crew. You can still go down there now. I think there's a little museum. I've, I've never been, but uh, there's some artifacts and things. <laughs> Sounds kind of neat. Of course, it was involved in the construction of the USS Akron and the USS Macon. Um, designed by uh, Karl Arnstein and his, his, what they call his disciples from Germany. Um, I love these, you, know, you see these men on top of these 30, 40 foot ladders called the gyrus ladders. Um, a lot braver than I am, I think back then they didn't have harnesses, they didn't have the safety that we have today. So, I don't know if there were any injuries, I assume there was, um, one thing I, I should look into. But Unfortunately, the Akron crashed, as uh, all you probably know, off the uh, coast in the Atlantic Ocean in 1933, killing 73 of the 76 crew members. It really spelled the beginning of the end for uh, America's rigid airship program, which was Paul Litchfield, uh, the CEO of the time, was really uh, involved in really pushing. He actually wrote a book of why these American new rigid airships. Maybe that's why. <laughs> that's why. A lot of uh, Danger involved with these, even once they uh, replaced uh, the flame with hydrogen, ga hydrogen gas with helium, uh, there were still a lot of, lot of issues with um, you know weather conditions that unfortunately brought these things down. Goodyear already had a contract uh, to the government to do the Megan, so that was constructed. It suffered a similar fate, uh, crashed into the Monterey Bay of the California coast. They did an archaeological underwater dig of this a few years ago. They're supposed to get some. I'm not sure they're regarding that. They, they never came my way, but uh, it, is, it is still there in Monterey Bay. Um, 
So, um, I have a few more slides, and I gotta pull up my other presentation, because these images are so big, um, it only allows me to put so many presentations. Do we have any questions so far while I bring up my other PowerPoints? Yes, sir. Yeah, my mother was employed at Goodyear, started with the Iwana Department, John Seidling, oh. and Bob Hanton. And okay. She was Mrs. Mrs. Goodyear. She was the best secretary. She worked in the law department, the okay. development department. Briefly, I uh, mahogany Grove, Charles, oh. Charles Elliott. Okay. And in the pantry department. And she tell us stories about what was happening behind the scenes. Okay. And one of them was the ND 500, the mm -hmm. competition between Firestone and Goodyear. Yes. According to what she said, if for the tires, they took them into, into the hotel room and slept with them. Okay. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Even nowadays, when you go there, they usually confiscate your phone or put a sticker over the camera so you can't uh, take any pictures of the top secret to the racing tires. Yeah. Interesting. What was her name, sir? Uh, Margaret uh, Lucas Brown. Okay. Interesting. Her up. She probably made a good year millions of dollars. Yes. When she worked in the packing department. Okay. Because she had phenomenal. Some more of them, so uh, yeah, maybe if you have time afterwards. Okay. Uh, that she, she had a wealth of knowledge. So um, let's see. It's showing on the screen, but it's not showing on my computer. So in addition to blimps, dirigibles, Air, uh, Goodyear was also involved in manufacturing a number of types of balloons, including free balloons, observation, garage balloons, stratosphere, advertising balloons, and of course figure balloons. Uh, those are some of the balloons out at Wingfoot Lake Hangar. Uh, they got involved in the early days in balloon racing, which was uh, kind of a, a, a daredevil sport at the time. Um, their team of pilots included Ward T. Van Orman, Carl K. Woolen and Walter W. Morton. Uh, they broke numerous records and won numerous races in both the national and international balloon races. Uh, this photo, I think, from 1928, was considered one of the most disastrous days in ballooning history, right after uh, there was a storm brewing coming in, and shortly after the balloons took off, two were struck by lightning, including one of the Goodyear balloons. Uh, Morton was killed instantly. Uh, while an unconscious Van Norman rode the balloon into the ground, surviving mir miraculously uh, with only a broken leg. So, uh, a lot braver than me. Uh, during the war, they manufactured uh, kite balloons that was used for observation, either the one basket or two basket type. Again, can you imagine you get hanging out there? Uh, and of course, you're being fired at as well. <laughs> Uh, barrage balloons during the Second World War. These were used over coastal areas, mostly to protect uh, harbors and uh, some of the, the, the fleet of warships. Um, so they would have a spider web of wires, metal wires, so if dive bombers or planes came in, they would get ensnared uh, in those wires. Goodyear was involved in uh, what were called stratosphere balloons, including this, the Century of Progress, 
uh, in the Explorer 1 and 2. This was kind of an early space race, uh, mostly between the United States and, and Russia, in which they were launching these balloons ever bigger, ever better into the stratosphere. The, wasn't really supposed to really break world records, but they did. Uh, it was really to gather uh, scientific information about the stratosphere. So we have a number of images showing the construction and operation of those images. Um, Goodyear started manufacturing uh, figure balloons and parade balloons, particularly for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, the first parade, I think, was in 24. In 27, uh, Macy's introduced their first uh, figure balloon. Uh, so between 27 and 1951, the time period for the book covers, Goodyear produced somewhere around 70 figure balloons for the parade, uh, mostly in the now famous balloon room here in Akron and later in Rockmart, Georgia. Uh, so this photo kind of shows they would manufacture them in pieces and then piece them together. There were riggers and sewers and balloon manufacturers and, and painters that would have come in and paint them. Many times they repaint them different years to create a different character. Uh, one year they had a panda bear that was later a teddy bear. Uh, I think the one that went through the most transformation was the cop. The, he's also a fireman and a baseball player. I think that's the one that's in Bear Park 34th Street, if you watch that. Um, it's always fun, most fascinating. So there's a number of images showing the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades uh, over the years. Of course, there was a, they took a hiatus during World War II and then started reproducing other parade balloons afterwards. Not only did they appear in the Macy's Parade, a lot of people don't know they appeared in other holiday parades, including Bamberger's uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, Bamberger's in, in New York, New Jersey. That's the Felix the Cat balloon, which some claim to be the first figure balloon and the first one to appear at Macy's. In fact, they did a, a reconstruction uh, a couple of years ago and said it was the 70th, 75th anniversary. Uh, some historians and scholars have argued that wasn't the first balloon. There's no documentation of it. I've tried to help resolve that uh, dispute, and I just gave up. <laughs> uh, they also appeared in the Gil Gilmore Circus Parades. Gil Gilmore Oil East Travel goes out along the West Coast. Uh, and they supposedly appeared in parades as far away as Canada, South America, and Europe. I, I found that in some newspaper accounts. Goodyear mechanical goods or things like belts and hoses and um, other things that usually serve industry rather than the general public. This is the largest roll of conveyor belt ever manufactured. These belts uh, like these help build the Shasta and the Grand Coulee dams, They're used in mining operations, uh, the Mesabi Range in Minnesota. So we have a number of these as well as those construction projects some of the feature of the book. Hoses don't sound all that interesting. They manufactured any type of hose you could possibly have. <laughs> Dredge hoses, so, uh, air hoses like these that were used not only to help build the Panama Canal, supposedly, uh, but also Mount Rushmore. Uh, houses, believe it or not, they manufactured houses during uh, the Second World War and shortly thereafter. Paul Litchfield said, of course, during the war, good viewers of the countries and the government's disposal, whatever they needed them to make, Second, I know we're running out of time. Uh, but they also made houses for the housing shortage and the post war uh, baby boom. Uh, these were transportable houses. They also made what were called igloo houses or balloon houses because of the construction uh, that was used, blowing up balloons, putting gunmen around it. Um, and then the final chapter covers war products. So you name it, Goodyear made, made it during the war. Gas masks, a lot of well, women on the production line making gas masks. Uh, the men that couldn't serve in the war um, helped make half tracks and anything pneumatic, anything inflatable, life rafts. Uh, the Wingfoot Clam, which is the Goodyear Company newsletter, is just chock full of accounts from down airmen writing uh, the company and they published some of these letters stating we were shot down in the Atlantic or shot down in the Pacific. Um, you know, your rafts really, really saved our lives. So uh, Eddie Rickenbacker uh, was one that survived. Uh, I think there's a book. Blanking on the title, but uh, one of my favorite things, the reason some of these were top secret uh, during World War II, um, the invasion of, of Nazi occupied Europe, uh, Goodyear was involved in what was called Operation Fortitude or Patton's Ghost Army. And they developed these decoys um, for inflatable pneumatic trucks and tanks and um, 
guns and cannons that, uh, you know, we, I don't know if we have any, I haven't seen any motion picture film of these we have in the collection, but I, they're some out there because I've seen on History Channel, you know, they'll just have a guy or two go under the tank and pick it up and move it over here. <laughs> <laughs> so this was all to deceive the Nazis uh, leading up to the, the invasion of Europe, uh, to make them think that we weren't going to be storming Normandy in June of 44, uh, you know, Normandy, that it was going to be the pot of clay. Um, and apparently it was very successful in helping uh, with that uh, invasion. Um, Goodyear was involved in the synthetic rubber, so World War II, most of our rubber comes from the Far East. The Japanese control most of those islands. They cut off our natural rubber supply. Goodyear, as well as other com companies, including the University of Akron, was involved uh, in developing uh, various types of synthetic rubber Chemagum was, was Goodyear's product. Of course, not only rubber, but they also manufactured airplane parts during World War II. And of course, we know the, the Corsair. I love this image because it shows it outside of uh, the Agricole Airport. We have one that shows it by the Doughboy statue outside of the, one of the ones uh, on display outside of the courthouse. It's just kind of neat image. So I couldn't put them all in the book. <laughs> they would only give me two. Gun production, uh, ordnance, uh, just amazing what, what the company produced over there, even just this short time span up to 1951. Uh, and then I just thought I'd throw in some fun ones because Christmas is on its way. So uh, the Santa Claus Parade Balloon, 1940, it made its first appearance in 41. It sadly deflated, disappointing a lot of the kids in the crowd. Uh, the early ones they used to release, and then they'd give a prize to the person that found it. And that became problematic, especially with airplanes that were passing by. If you're in early newspaper accounts, two people in New York complaining, I'm trying to get to work and they're having this damn parade. <laughs> uh, some of the other holiday themed ones, the stocking, uh, the giant candy canes, once in World War there. This is the figure gymnasium. So if that hoop is 10 feet, you know, this thing's about 30, 40 feet high, stretches into the rafters. Uh, for the Goodyear Christmas party that they had annually, it would show some of these in the Goodyear Gymnasium. The kids were there, they got gifts. Of course, Santa was there, one of my favorite images. Uh, that CW Cyberwing and the co-founder. If you go to Stan and do it, you'll see this image sometime. He doesn't look like a very happy Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, here's some better ones. I like the little kid here dressed as Santa. And even this little guy here in the war. <laughs> And of course, if you were Santa and you worked for Goodyear, you had to get around, right? So what better way to get around than your own blimp? Uh, so this was the Santa Claus Express. Uh, they dubbed it, I think it was the, the Puritan blimp. Uh, and I thought they did this several years, but I think they only did it in 1925. They put the banners. It's hard to see, but Santa Claus Express on the sign there. Because it was like toys to the kids. So that's all I got. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Some of you The book here, uh, they're available on Amazon, $49.95, the University of Akron Press website, your local bookstores. I'm offering a 40% discount tonight, $30. They make good Christmas gifts. Anybody who worked for Goodyear, had family that worked for Goodyear, I'll sign it, I'll inscribe it. No shipping and handling. <laughs> it's a good deal. I think uh, Vic will be happy to take questions. Well, yes, yeah, I, I want to got all night. Okay. And, uh, if you want to visit the archives real quick, we're in Polsky Building, soon to be renamed the Knight Building. Um, we're from 10 to 3 by appointment only, so you can come down. And we don't have a lot of display area where we display the materials, because we're mostly archival material. Uh, we have researchers coming down. If you'd like to come down and do research, look at some of the materials, uh, you can come down. There's how to contact us, our website, and uh, the website's with the digital collection find a lot of these images and some of the Goodyear films have been digitized. Maybe the grant years go to digitize some of the nitrate films. So yes. I was just curious about like the pictures that are in non Akron locations. Like who took those pictures and like how did I don't know, how did that occur? Why were they documenting it, I guess? Yes, yes. Well well Goodyear was uh, as I said uh, great in marketing and promotion. So anytime their products were being used 
across the country, across the world, they wanted images of it. So whether it was somebody that worked in that plant or that plantation or somebody sent them pictures, but they did have photographers, the fresh photographers uh, at the time that would go out. Even Aaron that retired years ago, he would talk, he, would, he used to travel around the world really taking photographs of, of the various products and you know, going to the races, he got to go to the NASCAR races all the time. So yeah, so they it, it's an amazing archive, really. They, they documented just about just about everything. People will call us, well, they had this balloon and that balloon. And why don't you have the drawings? Why don't you have the balloons? We got what we got. So some things disappear over the years or were lost. Loaned, maybe never came back. Yes, sir. Are there certain subtitles like this patent department? Yeah. Is there like so it's really, this book focuses on products, as I mentioned, so it's mostly each, each chapter is by the products. Oh, by the archives. So we can search the inventory of the Goodyear records by department, with patent department, law department, department 34D, whatever that was, you know. So we can search that. So if you're interested in trying to find information on your mom or that department, we can do some searches. On Dick's website, there's also online Winbook Clan edition, and they are searchable PDFs. So you can type in Marjorie and yeah. Brown, and it'll call up and highlight all the times that she was mentioned in the Winbook Clan. So you can read about it, you can figure out what the dates are, and then they have the 266 file drawers that he's got. <laughs> Each one has a date on it. So there's a little bit of, of uh, yes. Yes. hunting. In there, but but uh, he's got very valuable information that is is uh, been collected since 1993. So I got to tell you, in the last few years, he's been there. It's more organized and more usable. And um, I can personally tell you, for the last three years, that every public claim that Goodyear made, up to and including the information during the Ford versus Ferrari movie, all that information. It's an amazing resource, and we're, you know, glad and thankful that, that Goodyear donated to us, and you know, uh, so we can preserve it and make it accessible to the public. It's, it's an amazing history, and obviously, a lot of people connected with the company have fond memories of it. I think this gentleman was first, yes, sir. In regards to products, yes, Wikipedia lists three, the first three products of Goodyear were bicycle carriage tires, yes. hat for your horseshoe, yes, poker <laughs> chips. Poker chips, yeah, I did come across that. Poker chips, yeah, they did, I didn't include it, but they did manufacture they did. horseshoes in the early days. Yeah, poker chips, I did see that. The only poker chips I'm aware of were in the Goodyear World of Broadway exhibit and they were donated to uh, where they came from. The, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Stan Ewan. Uh, oh, Stan Ewan has it. Oh, I'd like to see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> they even tried manufacturing rubber roads for a while, rubber and roads, that was kind of after the time period of this study, but we have images of that. Supposedly, Akron had the first rubber road. Well, you've got the rubber paintings of uh, Charles. Yes, Goodyear. yes, which we recently got a grant to have restored. So uh, it's a painting of Charles Goodyear by uh, famous American portrait artist GPA Healy. A lot of his portraits hang in the National Portrait Gallery, but it was painted on a rubber canvas because they were trying to promote the, the use of rubber for just about everything. Just about everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, you can search the collection by the uh, yes, so if you go to um, our homepage or our digital collections website, you'll be able to do different searches uh, in there. You can search within the Goodyear collection, you can search within the Goodyear photographs, within the Goodyear good clans. It's a little difficult for the Uber, but we have a tutorial online that shows you how to do that. that that's helpful. Um, and then on our actual website, you can search, there's a search box where you can search for the various collections that so we not only have Goodyear's official corporate archive, but we have collections relating to Goodyear's history, such as, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but he was the personal pilot and assistant of Paul W. Richfield. People will call and say, Dad, Granddad worked for Goodyear, they did this. Uh, one gentleman was head of their, their big tire off the road tire sales, so we had his collection. Uh, you know, so, so you can search Goodyear and bring up all the collections we have. You know, a listing of those with the description of what's included. And then if you go into the digital archives, you can search everything we have in our digital archives, which I 
think this close to 80,000 materials now, including about 20,000 university photos, so many university graduates. We celebrated our sesquicentennial 150th anniversary two years ago, also during the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, that was a crazy time. Um, so we, we digitized all of our university history resources as well. And that's what we wanted. So, uh, university here kind of the art that was at bigger headquarters. I think a lot of that sold. Uh, we acquired some of the art uh, before my time period. So, you know, like um, Keith had mentioned, that the original portrait of Charles Goodyear, that, um, you know, the company was just named after him and then they acquired some things from the family. Uh, and oil the portraits of, of some of the executives and founders of the company. Yeah, so we, we have some of those. But uh, I don't think we received much from Goodyear Hall when they were uh, closed the museum. A lot of that went to Stan Hewitt. Um, portrait of uh, Charles Goodyear Jr. and Mrs. Goodyear, also on rubber panels, went to Stan Hewitt, and they think they sent him to the Mattatook Museum, uh, which is from the area where uh, Mr. Goodyear came from. Yeah. Yes, sir. We used to, uh, parents used to take us to the basketball games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would, would have loved to have seen those. That, that's my sport. Larry Brown, I've seen him coach. And, uh, yeah, that, was, that was fun. Yeah, I bet, I bet. So yeah, I want to follow memories. Depending on the type of artwork that you're thinking of, uh, if it was something that was commissioned by Goodyear, chances are it was sent to another museum or another Goodyear location. If it was a piece of commercial art, uh, they had two sales. One was the gymnasium sale where for Two weeks prior to the move, eight years ago, they would just set it all out with ridiculously low prices on it. And I bought the picture of uh, uh, one of our chairmen for five bucks. The year had spent five thousand having it painted, so I <laughs> packed it up and fed it into his summer home in Nantucket. Um, but then it went to an auction that was online, and it was amazing how inexpensively the, the stuff went. Because that art collection was actually that when the executives would travel all over the world, they gave their wives a, a fund to go out and buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. So they'd come home and they'd hang it in their home for a couple of years, they get tired of it, they give back to the company, and it, just, it sat on the first floor of, of uh, I don't know the building on Hunters. Anyway, the easternmost building on the, I'm sorry, westernmost building on, on Market Street sat in the basement there. And, the facility closed eight years ago. Now he's got some really cool stuff hanging out on the, on the fence in the last day. Yeah, I wish we had a more display area to display some of these things. We're hoping with the uh, new Knight Foundation donation to renovate the Polsky building and make it kind of an arts and cultural center for the community, uh, we're going to have a better space to, to display some of these materials. Aren't you upset that there's a name? I'll keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> that would be a big yes. I am too. I think it should be the Polsky slash night dash night or something. I don't know. We've already had three buildings on campus named for night. And, uh, I'm being recorded, by the way. So I love it. It's oh, a great okay. idea. It's great. <laughs> well, I'll start. Thank you to the Knight Foundation for the generous donation. Uh, they have some great plans to make that more of a community space and uh, art and performing arts center so that would be great but yes that will have I think now two or three buildings on campus named night so it's gonna be interesting setting directing people there. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one might university. Might, might, might. <laughs> so, any other questions I'm happy to chat afterwards. I can sign books if you're interested in buying books or have a little copy signed or inscribed or something you want to gift it to. Thank you so much.